Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar here at EBCO. We are going to be talking about fractal coding today and let's turn on our camera so everyone can see us. We can welcome you to the webinar. Hi Hello, everyone. Here we are. <laughs> So nice to have all of you today. This is a really exciting webinar to us. More and more we get asked, what is it about your methodology? How does it play a role in innovation? How is it different than other types of research that we see out there? Uh, why is it important? How does it work? All of those things we jam packed into this webinar to get you excited about thinking about fractal coding the same way that we think about it here. And this is how we service our clients and we strongly believe in all of the work that we've been doing that this is something that increasingly our clients are bringing in-house to start thinking this way. You know, just like times of the past when innovation was done a lot externally or mm -hmm. primary research was done, done a lot externally, but some of those functions have been brought internally with the help and support of some consultancies and vendors and things like that. We're seeing a lot of that in this new secondary methodology that we've really been working on and we're really excited to share that with you today. Awesome, so let's dive in. And please feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. All right, so hopefully you can see our screen. We are so excited to be here. We are EBCO, we are down in Austin, Texas. For those of you who are new to our team, we serve as a go-to resource for trends. We in inspire teams across all categories to think about new products, new technologies, new business models by pulling in inputs and fractals as we call them from all sorts of analogous and adjacent categories to inspire future thinking, to really support innovation efforts, future strategic thinking, and we work with clients around the globe across all categories. And if you're clear, curious to know about where our work leads, the value that it provides, it's in identifying new growth opportunities. So for instance, Imagine that you have been working in amongst certain categories for a long time, but you have a core capability or a core technology that you think could be very valuable in growing your company, let's say 4x or 10x in the next 10 years, but you don't know where those growth opportunities lie because perhaps they're in new categories that your team doesn't have core competency in or you haven't explored before. We identify those as part of our process. Also building custom trend frameworks. We've worked with a lot of teams before who look for ways to incorporate trends into a process that they're currently using, whether it's an innovation pipeline process, an R&D process, marketing and messaging, getting into new retail space. It's how can we leverage trends specifically for the work that we're doing, which is a lot different than receiving a more generic type of trend report that everyone can use, but one rather that fits into the type of work that you're doing enabling decision-making and prioritization, where are those hottest opportunities, and delivering actionable recommendations and opportunities. So making sure that work is actionable. Great, and a lot of this we're gonna be talking about today in this process of fractal coding. So if any of that is of interest to you, we'll be covering our process and how to adopt this methodology throughout this webinar today. So as you know, anyone on here, whether you're in marketing, innovation, R&D, you know that the world is moving at an ever-increasing pace. We see that AI is taking the place of human intelligence, and we will touch on that later. Kayla has a lot, of, a lot of perspective on that, and we think that we have a way of outsmarting AI. We'll get into that. Population growth is exponential, so so many people to account for in the decisions that we're making. Material supplies are diminishing, so how can we do things in new, modern, and sustainable ways? And startups are launching at an unprecedented rate. Yeah, so a lot of really exciting forces that one can be seen as a challenge or they can really seen as an opportunity. So there's always that dual side way of things, thinking about things and thinking about some of the threats and also the opportunities we're going to be facing in this next dec decade. So one of the big things that we're seeing is we're seeing a convergence and blurring of lines between categories. Yeah, absolutely. And when you, you, you can think of things like food becoming beauty or how everyone now calls himself a data company. We will be speaking with a CPG client and they're like, hey, we're going through a digital transformation to become a data company. And that's definitely a convergence and blurring between these lines. Or everyone is becoming a tech company. Something like that really, really highlights this and brings to life this idea that the convergence and blurring of lines between category is omnipresent at this point. Companies can no longer answer to just shareholders. It's imperative to consider external forces. So think about the expectation that companies might be, uh, might be required to be sustainable because of external uh, forces. Yeah, this is a really interesting one. There's a lot of viral videos going out around the globe, around experts and thought leaders and even legislators talking about how companies can no longer just answer to shareholders about profit gains they're going to have to think about their impact on the, on the planet. So we've seen a lot of financial companies talk about 
not funding companies any longer that are doing things that are detrimental to the environment. So it's a pretty interesting shift that we're seeing. We expect this to become much more disruptive. I mean, there's a lot of companies that are even famous for this, like JetBlue does it more through the lens of customer service, but they've been talked about as not having the highest shareholder earnings before because they actually want to give back to the consumer and have them have a better experience with their company. So this is a kind of an interesting way to think about this future lens where companies will band together and sort of take the place of what government has not been able to do, um, which is helping create a more sustainable planet, but also issues that are really core to their customers and also the environments and communities that they live in. Yeah, and we had a question come in asking if you will receive a copy of the slides. If that's important to anyone and you're hustling to take notes, we will be providing these slides after the webinar. And there has never been a more critical time to innovate. Certain resources we depend on now may not exist in the future. So innovation now is actually meaningful. So rather than just coming up with that new widget or that new technology, that new feature and functionality, it's actually mean meaningful in terms of how can we succeed into the future based on resources. And the decisions that Fortune 500 companies make could ultimately decide the fate of themselves and the fate of the planet. Yeah, this is really cool. I mean, this is really where the private sector is going to become just so influential when we think about the fate of where we're headed. Um, when we think of material usage, when we think of companies like Impossible and Beyond Burger, where they're trying to innovate on how can we create a food supply that's ultimately going to feed the population growth and also not diminish supplies. So it's really cool to think about that everyone on the call today could really have an impact with the type of work that you're doing, whether it's to use supplies more efficiently, it could be to think about innovation differently for the category, where are we going to find revenue and profit share growth if we have to think totally differently about what's even available to us on the planet. So these are really interesting spaces. And while there's a lot of challenge, there's also inherently a lot of opportunity as well. But we no longer operate in a world where traditional methodologies will lead to groundbreaking solutions. And this is something that EBCO firmly believes, which was the impetus for starting EBCO uh, years ago, is because when we see these linear, tech, li linear methodologies, and you'll see us talk about this in a minute, you'll see how they go towards answers that are very predictable rather than looking at groundbreaking solutions that come from all sorts of different inputs. And that's really what innovation teams are responsible for now. Brands cannot always do what they've always done in order to get ahead. It just won't cut it. Business as usual just isn't where it's at. So with this, we ask, how can brands stay relevant? How can they get ahead? And there are four key things that we're going to be looking at. So in our work, some of the world's largest brands, they're learning about how to get ahead or how they fall, fall behind in working with them, we've identified four key things. Rethink the role of trends and how they relate to innovation. Recognize that traditional linear mo models of insights and innovation are outdated. Prioritize looking at movement in adjacent and analogous industries, one of our favorites, and develop a structured and strategic approach to secondary research. Yeah, we're excited. We're gonna dive into each of these specifically. So the first one is rethinking the role of trends and how they relate to the function of innovation. So even if you're in an insight role, there's a lot of really good learnings here for thinking about how trends needs to be absorbed into the organization and ultimately how we can make sure that it's beneficial. Um, so what we see in our experience is that a lot of innovation and trends are treated separately. So maybe some of you on the call, you have a separate trends team, or maybe it's rolled up into the function of innovation, but it's Maybe there's no one on the team that does it specifically, or it's just there's not enough time to do it as part of the process. Um, we also see that sometimes it might be covered by an insight team, but again, a lot of times insight teams rely on actual consumer empathy experiences or doing ethnographies or focus groups. So it's trends is not inherent to that type of research. And what we found in our experience is just totally separate school of thought. Yeah, and when you think about this type of separation with trends and innovation separately, it results in trend reports that you look at and you think this is interesting and I can tell that there's a nugget of information here that I should be considering, but I don't quite know what to do with it with regards to my category because it might be external to your category or have a different perspective, but it hasn't been addressed specifically for how you should innovate or utilize that information. So we're going to launch a poll real quickly. Answer this true or false. I have seen a trend report or research that was interesting, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with the information or rephrased, I, you know, it wasn't quite actionable for me, or it took a lot of time to digest. I had to do more with it. Yeah, this is a big one that we hear with a lot of, a lot of clients that we've worked with um, prior to working with them, or even just kind of out there in the innovation spectrum. We've heard this a lot is like they've, a lot of individuals have heard of trends like AI or urbanization, kind of those larger macro forces we always talk about when we're thinking of environmental threats and 
what we need to be thinking about as we move towards the future. But oftentimes they're just not specific enough. So if you were innovating for deodorant or beauty products, thinking about AI, you might wonder what the connection is to your category. And so something that, that is that high level doesn't often give us a roadmap or a pipeline to work against when we think about how does trends intersect into innovation specifically. Yeah, and if you're curious, the result of that quick poll, 80% of you said this is true, that I've seen interesting reports, but I don't quite know what to do with it. So we really believe that winning in the future requires bringing these two disciplines together. And there's some great organizations out there that already do this and really have trends embedded into the vision of where their company's headed. So when you think of um, some companies like Tesla or Nike, they do a really good job of bridging in where they're going because they're trying to lead their categories and innovate ahead of where the consumer's already at. Um, and then there's other organizations that have a more reactive philosophy of letting the market get ahead and then coming up with a product after that. I think what we've found is the Me Too innovation doesn't work as well as it used to. Um, not to say that's in every case, um, but we found that more and more we hear that companies truly want to have differentiated innovation and they want to leapfrog their competition. They want to get ahead. It doesn't mean launching something their customer is not going to like, but ultimately being in charge of their own process. So understanding what trends are coming, being able to track those and ultimately thinking about how to make those actionable for the organization. So we found is that trend really needs to be embedded with an insight and innovation team in order for those to become more actionable and to become a pipeline and actually move into development. Otherwise, it just tends to live sort of at a layer of information that the organization isn't actually utilizing. All right, number two, recognize that traditional linear models of insights and innovation are outdated. This is absolutely one of my most favorite ones <laughs> to talk about. The reason being is because I'm actually an expert in traditional linear models, defining the target consumer, recruiting those consumers for research, uncovering insights, pain points, and opportunities, and designing and solving for them. And I'm pretty sure every single person on this call is familiar with this model and has probably engaged with it and still uses it because it's highly valuable for uncovering unmet needs and identifying pain points that we can solve for within the innovation processes and the R&D that we're doing today. So if we have a product that we can improve or some messaging that we can improve upon um, or add features and functionality, this is very successful. But in the future, and now for us at least, to have an impact on the future, we believe that in this increasingly multidimensional and interconnected world, traditional linear, method linear methodologies don't work. They don't lead to enough dimensionality, thinking about different fractals across all different categories, inputs of what's happening in a business model in one category that could impact what our consumers are expecting of us in our current category, or how is the technology in category A going to impact the movements and the shifts in category B. Yeah, and one example I can give to this that's just top of mind because the products are sitting right behind me is um, all of the innovation we've seen um, around single-use products. So if you imagine, if you were on the Ziploc innovation team, um, I imagine just based on how they've innovated in the past and what I've seen at the store, a lot of the questions have been around, like, how do people use Ziploc? Like, what are, you know, some pain points when someone's making a snack for their kids? Like, how are they organizing those compartments? And that's where you get to some of the innovation where you can divide the compartments out or um, maybe bigger bags like gallon storage that would go in the freezer. So that probably came from a lot of infield observance of how consumers cook, how they meal prep, how they pack lunches for their kids. But um, the example I'm going to give you next could show where you could miss that. Um, so if you've heard of stasher bags, they're reusable, reusable silicone bags where they have a sustainability play. Um, they are kind of more premium. They come in fun colors. They're something that says something about you as a consumer. If someone sees you using them, people are going to ask like, oh, is that a stasher bag? And you can see where that comes more from a trend methodology versus observing the consumer because that's crossing over from other categories that are thinking about materials more innovatively, um, thinking about you know consumers that are photographing their meal prep and have this cool colored silicone bag now. But it also hits on desires to be more sustainable and to stop reliance on single use plastics and then ultimately save money over the long term. So that's an example where um, you can think about how you could do both models and still make sure that you're covering where there's going to be unmet needs and opportunities by looking at how other categories are innovating and where we're seeing trends start to trickle in the category. Yeah, absolutely. So really going beyond what we see immediately with consumers and following this process, but looking at information that we can pull in from other spaces. Another really exciting one that we've seen 
uh, penetrate a lot of different CPG categories lately is the plant-based trend, of course, but also lab-created naturals and ways of finding new types of ingredients that come from other spaces that we really wouldn't be able to uncover by speaking with consumers directly, but rather seeing what's happening, happening in science, in technology, um, in biofuels. There's a lot of really interesting spaces to take these inputs and start thinking about how they can apply to other categories. Yeah, plant-based is great because, you know, a few years ago, I think a lot of us would have maybe made the comment that that's like, you know, that's great for food and beverage, but I'm not sure what that means for me. And then today we just see so many examples of plant-based packaging, um, even like plant-based paint, but plant-based is really crossed over because the consumer connects the dots of like, oh, I'm interested in plant-based and food and beverage. I'm also interested in that in my packaging or in my um, houseware supplies whatever it might be. Um, but that's an example of a fractal that we see crossing over. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit as we go throughout this about how to identify those and where we can find those natural patterns that are already occurring outside of your category. So that leads me into a great transition for prioritizing looking at movement in adjacent and analogous industries. So we're going to run another poll now. And this one's asking, where does your organization look for insights most often? Is it in your bit within your business, your consumers, your competition, your industry, or other? All right, we have some good answers coming through. I know this is forcing you into one space. One which, space. So but. you can prioritize which one you look at the most. I'm sure that you you cross a couple of these every time you begin an investigation. And what's really interesting about the results that are coming in, um, as we as we might have predicted, as you might have predicted, consumers is the number one space where people are pulling their insights, and then pretty evenly spread across business, competitors, industry, and other. So we find that most brands are experts at knowing their core consumers, their segmentation, um, who likes their products, and maybe even what their consumers are looking for. I think Vital Proteins is a brand that does a really great job at this. Of They innovate a lot of their products based on how people use their product on social media. Um, so they have a really good understanding of their fan base and what people are looking for. They actually had, a, so they have collagen powders, if you're not familiar with them, that um, you can add to a smoothie or to, to water to get a daily, your daily collagen intake, which has partly been a huge trend because of paleo and Whole30 diets and keto. And one of the observations they had was that a lot of times people use this in their coffee. And so they came up with a coffee creamer product. And so that's an example of just really knowing their customers, knowing how they were using the product. And that was kind of their strength really is innovating by having that, those awarenesses. Um, and then we also find brands are really experts at knowing the competitive landscape. So who are, who's number two and three behind them? or even who's ahead of them. Um, and really good at knowing when someone has launched an innovation and maybe where their team either decided not to go down that path, fell short, or you know, leadership might be now saying, hey, why don't we look at this because we notice our competition is looking at this. So we find that that's a really good foundational expertise that most companies have. Um, but sometimes this often results in a very heads down approach to insight gathering, um, which can mean entire categories can be blindsided by disruptive new entrants that they never saw coming. So an example, this would be Ring. Um, so I don't know if you've saw the famous Shark Tank episode now where Ring was talking about this disruptive new doorbell technology. And most of the sharks gave him the feedback that it's really hard to change consumer behavior. You're not gonna get everyone to go install these doorbell cameras. You're not gonna get people to go out and seek out this product. And he's like, yeah, but it's such a pain point. It's, you know, there's innovation happening in IoT across categories. Consumers want smart home tech products. You look at things like the Nest thermostat, like this is a just kind of a natural extension of that. And they're having exponentially more things delivered to their home. Yeah, as well as e-commerce is growing. Um, Porch Pirates was like a trend that started many years ago and has continued on. And the fact that people now are kind of open to this type of surveillance and open to this um, tech really coming into their home. So he talked about his vision of where he wanted it to go, but they couldn't see it based on where the current market was at. They're like, you know, as soon as you do this, like ADT and other companies are going to innovate and take you out. So they talked a lot about um, the, he couldn't get there because the incumbents they thought would basically displace him. Well, you know, fast forward a few years and Shark Tank even acknowledges that that was their biggest miss that they had uh, because of the acquisition by Amazon for Ring um, with, I think it was a billion or, or more. And now it's part of the Amazon brand. And so they talk about how that was a huge miss and I think one of the reasons they missed that is because while they're true that it did change consumer behavior, that's just one lens of how to look at it. So it missed the shift that other industries were having in the smart home space. It missed the success of products like Nest. Um, it missed the fact that there's been in general, there had been kind of a lack of smart home innovation up to that point. 
And also that companies, um, security companies more traditionally sort of force consumers into this business model that they don't want to be in. Um, so it was pretty interesting. It's really disruptive thinking. Um, and so that's where we're seeing that now because entrepreneurs and companies can really just bubble up. I think we're at a, you know, a time in history where digitization has really allowed anyone to launch a product um, and do it more quickly and find a manufacturer. It's just that there's more competition out there because information is so democratized now. So moving forward, we really think that the focus should shift to broadening the frame of reference. So thinking about, you know, if you're in a category like security, you know, thinking of other influencers that could cross over. So, you know, it could be around smart home and how that's going to continue to grow. It could be around automotive security, like thinking of other areas that a consumer might want to be secure. Thinking about new business model innovation, um, really seeing how other service-based industries have innovated and how we could challenge our perceptions of our normal business model for selling these services. And so you can see how you can start to build your own fractal plane of how to think about the category very differently to one, just challenge your perception of the category. Think about how consumers are experiencing it based on other categories that they operate in and also think about. And also thinking about disruptively, what would a startup or a small brand or maybe an Amazon if they're, they're coming after your category, thinking about how they're gonna think about disrupting your category. And that's where we can really start to get to more adjacent thinking, more analogous thinking, and also just more disruptive thinking because it disrupts the normal flow of how our brain wants to think about the category. Um, so some examples here are, are charcoal. Um, so that was an example that now, of course, we can see this one out there, but it was in the food industry and the vitamin industry, and it crossed over into teeth whitening and oral care um, because it was part of the naturals movement. Consumers were interested in non-toxic ingredients, looking at ways to reduce fluoride intake, and it's also in beverages now. Um, so it's interesting to see how that crossed over so completely. Um, Naturals is one where it started in food and beverage. So a lot of us are familiar with shows like the Expo West, um, which now is just so gigantic compared to how it started as a really small kind of independent little show. Um, or even we think of Whole Foods really leading, being one of those pioneers of the natural movement. Um, and now Naturals has crossed over to beauty. I mean, there's almost thousands, I can guarantee, of natural beauty brands out there. I mean, I get... I um, get targeted a lot because of the type of research I do on Facebook and Instagram, and I see new brands every day, dozens of new brands, small players that are looking to disrupt and looking to get acquired. But, you know, there's just so many options if you're a consumer and you're interested in naturals. It's crossed over into cleaning, so not using toxic ingredients and even bedding. Um, mattresses talk about being natural and non-toxic now. Direct to consumer. So this, a lot of these products, um, one of the biggest ones was Warby Parker going direct to consumer, eliminating the distribution channel. I think about Warby Parker, that was 10, 12 years ago. I mean, yeah. really a long time ago, right at the beginning of this. And everyone thought it was so radical. Everyone thought it was so radical. Also like um, Dollar Shave Club was one of the first ones that did really well. And then it went into Casper when you think of mattresses. Um, now we're seeing it with pharmacy innovation. So a lot of um, drugs and self-care products direct to a consumer so they don't have to see a doctor so they don't have to go to the pharmacy and now it's just pretty much in every consumer category and i can tell you based on um, our experience we've had every company pretty much that we've ever worked with say that it's that's a huge challenge because they don't have a direct to consumer model in-house there's so much infrastructure so sometimes these regulatory thoughts or these thoughts of the red tape involved in going across functionally they stop us from really thinking about innovation more holistically and stop us from thinking about, you know, if direct-to-consumer does continue to grow at this unprecedented rate that it's been growing at, or there are thousands of brands that now compete with ours, you know, is it still worth the investment to go after? So that's where we really have to start with this wider lens because we don't want to eliminate something that we think is going to be too difficult when maybe it's the thousand pound elephant in the room that we need to be aware of. Yeah. And you may be familiar with the saying, like, this is the way we've always done things. This is one that Caitlin and I cringe when we hear it because there's there's no doubt that there is there is methodologies that are tried and true and that people have expertise in, but that doesn't mean it's the only way that we should be looking at things. Yeah, absolutely. Especially just, I mean, if you look at the, hu the history of the planet, like change is one, the only thing that's constant is that we're consistently changing. I and mean, one of the biggest things we face now is we kind of had the internet era and now we're on the cusp of the era of AI. And I mean, in the next decade, things are expected to rapidly change in just how information is consumed, how companies can automate, 
as well as new types of products that are going to, um, when we think of 5G and how things are connected and talk to one another, there's just going to be an unprecedented amount of data out there. We're really at kind of a differentiated time in history again, kind of this new chapter is coming. And so really thinking and challenging our conventions and ways that we do things is only going to make us stronger at innovation and stronger at um, being disruption proof. Awesome. So that leads us to number four, develop a structured and strategic approach to secondary research. And as many of you know, it makes sense to be a practitioner of primary research. And there's a lot of skill that goes into that, which is myself, my expertise going way back. And so thinking about how to create a structured approach to secondary research is quite a new lens for a lot of our clients because it goes far beyond just Googling. And we're going to get into that in a second. And historically, the best way to get information was to do primary research, go out and see what people are doing, observe them. But with the advent of the internet, the information explosion, companies all of a sudden have all of this information at their fingertips, but what do we do with it? With so much information, it's pretty ubiquitous. We see it everywhere. How do we pull this in in a structured way to think about how to leverage the secondary research so that we can actually action on it rather than just walking by our colleagues and say, hey, did you read this? Or hey, did you see this article? Or this is something really cool that someone's doing but pull it together in a way that is so well thought out and so structured that we can actually utilize the information. So we're gonna launch another quick poll. How many of your companies, maybe that you've worked at, have a structured or strategic approach? What stage are you and your team in the innovation planning process? Okay, great. So it looks like a lot of you are kind of answering across the board, which is awesome. That means we have a lot of different perspectives on this call of where we're thinking about innovation and where we're currently at. Um, it's also pretty interesting just given that given the number of people on the call, how many focus on front end and pre-strategy as well as product development, awesome. Okay, and we'll touch about on those stages in just a second as well. All right, so like primary research, secondary research is a learned discipline. You have skilled researchers who can design surveys, moderate focus groups, do the analysis, make recommendations, but we also need to see a similar and thoughtful approach happening with secondary research. And like I said previously, it's much more than just Googling it. And we've seen that a lot with the clients that we've worked with is, oh, well, we have someone who does that, or we've been looking at similar things. And what we find out as we probe deeper and we share more of what our expertise is, is that they in fact are just Googling it, which is, of course, as practitioners in research, market research, innovation, we are technically the people in our organizations that are in the know. So it's no surprise that a lot of the conversations we have do touch on individual bits of information that companies think are interesting, but really pulling it together in a more robust way and looking at it from all of the appropriate touch points to build out what is this framework, what are these lenses and trends that we should be looking through in order to understand this information in a much more strategic way is something that most organizations have not yet fulfilled or implemented within their process. Yeah, and this one's really interesting. Even the market research um, shows that we've been to this past year, a lot of them had sessions on how to develop a secondary research methodology internally. So I think a lot of organizations are aware that there's just so much data that most people are overwhelmed by the amount of data and they're looking for ways to prioritize decision making and also look for a way to streamline things and clarify which areas they're gonna go after. There is a whole methodology involved in this similar to how you approach primary research, the structure, the setup, the types of questions you ask. You have to think of secondary being, where am I gonna look? How am I gonna filter? What kind of sources am I gonna use? How am I gonna have a strategic lens? There's all of those questions that also go into making this process successful that we find that people tend to overlook just because I think it's taken for granted that you can just Google something or look for a secondary report and we're missing that whole strategic analysis part that has to happen. So as a result of these learnings, um, we founded EBCO. So we are in our sixth year of business at EBCO and we're really excited by the fact that throughout our history, we have focused predominantly on trend research methodology and bringing that to organizations. And the methodology, we get asked that, that's the number one question we get asked on every call is like, well, what is the methodology behind this? And how do you guys actually do this? Because to some people, trends sound like predicting the future or you're looking at something that's unseen. So how do you actually do it? And so the process we landed on in identifying the methodology that we use is called fractal coding. So this is what we deem as the practice and expertise of discovering patterns. So being able to identify clusters and patterns that we're seeing across category. And sometimes they exist at different levels of elevation. So sometimes we see them happening horizontally across category. Sometimes they might be happening analogously. So there's some categories that have a higher degree of influence on one another. So that one might be like wellness and beauty right now. 
and nutraceuticals, they have a high degree of correlation between each other. So there tends to be a, a, a flow and a rhythm that we can sort of predict at this point. And sometimes at different scales. So a trend like AI might have a higher degree of impact on industries that can really leverage the data and start to streamline that into the organization. Then maybe a company that like, if we think of like toothpaste or oral care, where they might be slower to adopt it because they just don't have the infrastructure internally yet for a lot of companies to adopt it. So it's a process that um, we go through and we recommend where we can identify these emerging signals and patterns and how they're ultimately going to accumulate. So where we start to see a greater degree of occurrence and where they start to collide and interact with each other. So that might be like when you think of a sustainability trend versus e-commerce, they're sort of at odds with one another sometimes because people are shipping more, they're ordering online more, but they also care about the environment. So that's sort of a collision point that's happening. And that's why we see more innovation happening at that pain point intersection. And ultimately what we see is that how do these forces start to interact with one another and ultimately disrupt that market landscape? And how does that pendulum start to swing? So a lot of times in our, the trend work, we like to look at what the shift is. As we get an example would be as more natural brands flood the market, that becomes a table stake. And then where does the shift then happen to? And that's what Aaron alluded to when we talked about things like lab created naturals or things that also have a sustainability story or talk about science coming back in. So we look at where does that shift happen as more of these signals start to occur at a greater frequency. Yeah. And if you have some major takeaways from this slide, it's that the trend methodology that we use and fractal coding is not futurism and it's not Googling it. So just keep <laughs> that in mind as you take your notes. Yeah. And I'm sure some of you have maybe um, been around a futurist or maybe somebody internally that you think is really good at futurism. But those are almost like scenario planning where it's very far out. You're looking at these environmental macro forces that are going to all come together and sort of what those future scenario patterns could look like. Uh, we believe fractal coding is that in-between step where we can identify our category over the next one to five years and sometimes even further because some categories have a higher development time and where we can see where there's movement and momentum that requires our attention, whether it's for strategic planning purposes, whether it's to plan out our innovation pipeline, whether it's to be aware of why we're gonna invest in one area versus another, and also to identify white space and things that our company could go into where there's high growth potential and where we're gonna find more growth than just incremental. So you might be wondering where fractal coding comes from. It actually borrows its name from fractal thinking and axial coding. So fractal thinking is an abstract method of thinking which follows non-linear pathways to identify patterns. Um, so what that means is we can start to correlate that certain signals that we're seeing ultimately support one another or they disrupt one another. So it's a way that we can start to cluster things together and think about how through deductive and inductive thinking, think about what those mean for one another as these start to happen in an industry specifically. Um, so it does not follow a linear path. It's not kind of X plus X equals Y thinking. That can be, that can be a big challenge sometimes when we're thinking of things that might be outside of our category space and how they're gonna cross over. And then axial coding is a qualitative process that is actually something named if you were to Google this. This is through a process that your brain goes through when it's relating information. So if you were trying to relate a category and concept to each other, so we are thinking like X is sort of like Y, or you know if this happens and this might happen, that's the process that your brain would go through to think this way. So if you're wondering, just to take a step back briefly, our background, I'm Erin talking right now and Kaylin's here as well. We are human empathy meets trend expertise. You've heard me talk about this a couple of times that my background is in primary research and Kaylin's background over the years has become a very well-developed sense of trend expertise. And so pulling these together means that in the methodology that we use and that we leverage with our clients, it's using that human empathy and seeing how consumer behaviors are changing, how their expectations are shifting, matching that with the trend expertise and seeing where that movement and momentum is happening in industries so that together we're not only doing something that is looking towards the future based on all of these inputs but it also lands in that consumer mindset that consumer behavior so it's relevant at the end of the day to the people that you all are trying to serve yeah and in our experience what we found was just doing consumer research or doing insight work on its own just left us with big gaps of knowledge internally and so that's really why we wanted to always have trends at the, the forefront or the front end process of any type of innovation or um, identification of new opportunity spaces for companies that we offer. 
So where, if you're doing this internally, um, where, if you're wondering like, where do we get inputs or where do you guys get your inputs? I get this question a lot as well. So these are just some examples. I mean, once, if we had a category identified, we could get a little bit tighter here, but I think this gives you some good insight on how to start thinking about these fractals or thinking about where would you even look if you're building up a secondary methodology. methodology. So one would be rising companies. So thinking of startups and disruptors that are coming into the category, this is really um, crucial. I find that these startups just have so many good insights about why they're going into the category. I just saw some over the weekend that were natural fragrance companies. So they talked about the fact that they're the first non-toxic fragrance company. There's even a company that does functional fragrance. And they talked about um, how you get a functional benefit out of spraying yourself with their fragrance product. So I imagine it has botanicals in it or some type of essential oil and it's relating to stress or the desire to pick yourself up. But those companies give us some insight that there's an insight that they've found that consumers want fragrances that are non-toxic, that people are worried that there's mystery ingredients in their fragrances. Um, and they talk about a lot of this positioning on their website. So those are great sources. And of course, we want to look at the degree that this is happening. I mean, how many functional fragrance companies are there now? How many startups have entered the fragrance space? How much is that category growing? And are there any retailers, like as Target started to have a functional fragrance section, how many naturals products are they carrying there? This gives us some good insight very quickly on a new white space opportunity that might be emerging for fragrance in a pretty rapid pattern. DIY and workarounds. Um, so using this fragrance example, if we were innovating for a fragrance company, we might start to look at, are there any DIY products that consumers use to build their own fragrances? What's kind of a alternative to fragrance that people could use? Maybe it's oils, maybe it's using some kind of fabric refreshener, like what are some behaviors that we're seeing on social platforms or Pinterest or other areas where we feel like there's people that are engaged in the category and they're talking about this. That could also go into emerging consumer behaviors. So sometimes at this stage, you might have some foundational work internally or some knowledge that there's some behaviors maybe going away from the category or Maybe there's a new player that's launched and really looking at what is that behavior behind that shift. And this could also go into social listening. So looking at how people are talking about these brands, what are some of the adjacencies that they're going to and what are some of their pain points in talking about these products? Also domain experts. So we like to identify experts that are somewhat adjacent to the category. So this might be a natural beauty expert. And you know what's some interesting in these conversations is I imagine if we were to talk to a naturopath or someone that has clients in the natural space or um, somebody who's really big on a clean, non-toxic lifestyle, they're going to tell you that they probably don't recommend that their clients wear fragrance. I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you there's a lot of, and when you are a new mom, they'll tell you a lot of times not to use lavender around your sons. There's some evidence there that points to that that could just be disruptive to their hormones. And then there's a lot of hormone experts who tell you not to wear fragrance. So looking at all these different fractals of experts that talk about fragrance and sort of what is the kind of underlying movement that we're seeing that fragrance is heading to, or what's the consumer connotation as movements like naturals and plant-based have gotten much bigger. And the most important element to making fractal coding actionable to your team is not to look at all of these individual points as individual inputs. You can imagine that many of you have read a business case or seen what an expert has to say or, ex or went to an expo or a show and you're bringing back information, but until you start, layering it and converging the information from all of these different fractals and building up a grander picture of what it means, then you don't have an idea of exactly what it means to your category and how to action on it. So pulling back here, fractal coding, let's go back to those four main themes that we were talking about, rethinking the role of trends and how they relate to innovation. Fractal coding with this method, it brings trends and innovation together, analyzing trends in a way that tees up specific innovation ideas. It's very, very directional. Number two, Recognize that traditional linear models of insights and innovation are outdated. So thinking about how fractal coding relies on a fractal rather than a linear process. And that specifically means we don't decide ahead of time what is it that we're studying, putting some sort of discussion guide or outline together to, to specify the approach that we take and predetermine what it is that we're looking for and what type of answers we're going to be getting from different individuals, but rather we're looking at fractals, which are complex patterns that repeat across different scales. And by scales, it could be different amounts of different industries in analogous spaces, 
And so that's where that expertise really comes in and digging into this in so many different ways and being able to layer that information. The third one here, prioritize looking at movement in adjacent and analogous industries. That's one of our favorites. Fractal coding is about identifying how themes and patterns bubble up in one industry and then spread to adjacent analogous industries. And I think when Kaylin was talking about direct to consumer, this is one of our favorite examples of really how this came to be to really launch entirely new industries or doing thing, doing entirely new ways of reaching consumers. And then number four, develop a structured and strategic approach to secondary research. So fractal coding is a secondary research methodology that produces uniquely rich and nuanced results, borrowing principles from the data analysis involved in what we call axial coding. So having said all that, fractal coding can be used to track trends as they grow, evolve, and move into new categories, identify specific product innovation opportunities. That one's really exciting for individuals that we work with and teams that we work with in innovation who are looking for new methodologies for inspiration, new ways to grow their company without utilizing traditional methodologies, or where honestly traditional methodologies have fallen short for them. They feel like they've studied the consumer in depth. They are experts across all of their different target segments, and yet they still don't quite know which direction to go. And then identify potential acquisition targets, which is another growth strategy we see a lot now. Yeah, acquisition is a huge one, especially because there's so many dozens and dozens, if not thousands, sometimes of startups that are entering categories, especially if you're in the food and beverage space specifically. This is a case study that we wanted to walk through with how to think about axial coding and also think about this process of how to think about innovation differently. So if you imagine a very traditional category like a gas canister that you might use for camping or for fuel, you can imagine that a lot of the innovation might be around you know, thinking of the tactile experience, thinking about if there's any kind of error that the user might have when they're plugging it into their stove, thinking about the weight of it and how you carry it. So some pretty traditional pain points that consumers might have as they're talking through it or, you know, what the process looks like, the shopper journey to go and buy that at the store for a camping trip. One of the ways to think about this differently is first to identify where there's trends happening within that space. So what's a larger category where you know, gas canisters exist in, for camping. That would be a category more around outdoor usage or outdoor living or outdoor, outdoor activity. And then identifying trends that happen within that space. This is an example of some trends that we've identified where looking at the popularity of camping. So seeing, we were seeing a lot of new seg campers enter the segment. We were seeing high-end luxurious glamping that resulted in just more hotels and more outfitters having products that speak to somebody who's looking for a more aspirational experience. And we also saw environmental awareness. So when we talked about plant-based earlier, that's also something we've seen crossover to fuel. So looking at things that are bio-based, bio things are refillable. When you think of a circular economy, thinking of brands that now have packaging structures where you can refill. Also thinking about concentrated formats, so things that don't require as much waste when it comes to the package or even the product itself. And even when you think of pod formats that exist in other categories, looking at how indoor and outdoor spaces are blurring. So as we've warmed up in some areas and weather has extended the season, where are we now seeing a desire for even more items that we can have in our own backyards? Or how can we expand that camping experience to our own yards? So thinking of things like fire pits, thinking of the patio as sort of the secondary living space. The next area was around minimalist lifestyle. So thinking about what we're seeing as a trend with consumers, which is around minimalism, kind of reducing the amount of items you need, which really ties in well with an outdoor category where you ultimately want to reduce the weight of items that you have to bring with you. So you can sort of see a framework that we built here, which you know resulted in a lot of all the areas I just mentioned did not come at the top of our, our, our minds. Like there's a lot of the process that we defined in the slides previously were used to identify those trends. And then we took those trends and we ultimately identified innovation areas based on the trends that we were seeing. So what you see here is it's just a framework for thinking about how we can seemingly take a category where there's not a lot of innovation. When people think sometimes of camping canisters, you, your brain probably doesn't go to, wow, that space is so exciting or wow, there's a lot of disruption happening there. It doesn't always have to be the case. We can take something very seemingly kind of mundane or pretty standard or having incremental growth and then really blow out different ways to think about white space in that category, different ways to think about innovation, different trends that that consumer is experiencing that impact their expectation in that category. 
And then also what are new analogs and adjacencies now? And this can even help when we're thinking about, as Aaron mentioned, acquisition targets. So now that we have these trends identified, how do we go into that space? What's the job to be done? So you can see an example of some here that we identified, which help them ultimately go into these new territories that we've identified and have acquisitions that make sense to grow that market and to grow that potential segment where they can then start developing new products for them after those acquisitions. So how can you try fractal coding? And we love to start with these questions when anyone asks us this. What categories are adjacent to yours? What movements are happening there that might influence your category? A great way to start thinking this way is thinking about your end consumer. If you think about your end consumer and what type of categories or products or other areas or industries that they're populating, you can think about those are adjacencies to them. So that's where their expectations start to shift and what they're expecting of your category or your product start to get highlighted in their mind. And then of course, what's adjacent to yours? What's adjacent to camping or cylinders like Kaylin was just talking about? What types of categories are analogous to mine? What can I learn from what's happening in those categories? How might movements happening at different scales intersect and impact my category? So think a micro signal like an ingredient trend versus a macro signal like sustainability. When we start thinking of micro signals, we learn a lot. Macro doesn't always guide us in a way that is actionable. We all know that sustainability is important, but it's hard to know which direction to go because the scale is just too large. And then based on the trends I've identified, what specific innovation ideas would meet the emerging needs? And this is just a really cool way of deducing new types of information. So if I see these trends and I use my expert research abilities, whether I'm a primary researcher, secondary researcher, an innovation or marketing professional, I start to think, what are these trends doing for end consumers? What types of needs are they answering? What gaps in the market are these trends addressing? And by taking and extracting that information, I can start to think of new ideas and new innovation opportunities in my product category. Yeah, and that's actually the way that empathy comes back into the process, number four that Aaron talked about, which is what meets a need that the category generally has and we find that most clients can really speak to these and already have a lot of great foundational perspective on needs in the category. It's the understanding kind of what areas to prioritize and also what is new white space that generally tends to be where this process really brings in the value. In terms of diversifying your thinking, so now we're going to talk about the human element of this. So we talked a lot about the methodology and the process, but really key to fractal coding is diversifying your thinking. So I love this stat, but according to the National Science Foundation, the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Of those, 80% are negative and 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts as the day before. So you can start to think of when we see, um, I see a lot of these quotes on LinkedIn, but this is the way we've always done it. This is what we've done historically. You know, we have this skill set internally. This tends to be a lot of the thoughts that just get recirculated throughout the organization and they start to become sort of an ethos that really prevents anyone from thinking differently sometimes. And I think just even as humans, if we think about the thoughts that we have every day that are personal thoughts, it's just interesting to think that we really regurgitate and recirculate a lot of the same information. So to acquire more diversity of thought, we recommend one, we'll talk about growth mindset. But two, just awareness of how your brain normally wants to compute information or think about information. So I'm really obsessed with the idea of thinking of ourselves as computers and thinking about us having our own linear pathway or neural pathway that information wants to go down. And so if we have an awareness of how we normally think about things, we can disrupt that flow of information and think about it differently, which is really important because I think out of even all of the companies we've worked with, I can tell you that every single person has been different. And every single person, I imagine we could bucket into different personality types. So it's just really interesting to think about how each person has that ability to innovate, but they're all doing it a different way. And so there's definitely some limitations and also some opportunities that we can grasp from that. So one is embracing a growth mindset. So this is a belief that a person or company's intelligence and abilities can be developed over time. It's the ability to know that even though we've been successful in the past, or we maybe have done things right in the past, that we have to have that growth mindset of what way forward is gonna help us achieve our goals. Collaboration with um, maybe an outside resource or a partner or someone new internally is gonna help expand our potential. And we prioritize future-proofing for our company. So you can see sort of the fixed thoughts that can occur, which usually are done from that protection mindset or maybe from a mindset of like, 
being worried that if ideas get out there, they might be stolen, whatever it might be. That's what usually causes us to kind of have that more circular thinking um, and where we stay in that fixed mindset. Um, and then two, awareness of how our brain normally computes. So your unique perspective shapes how you think about the world and ultimately your role in innovation. And so diversifying your thinking, we must first identify what your brain's normal way of working and processing information is, and then also become aware of it. So I'm sure you guys have taken a lot of self-assessments over the years, or even maybe throughout your work career, you've taken different assessments. These are some that we're going to recommend that we have found really valuable and also on trend, I would say, um, in today's culture. So first one is Enneagram. If you were on our Enneagram webinar, this is where we talk about how the Enneagram describes how you relate to the world and also how you're motivated. So this is one that's really big in pop culture right now. And it's really identifying what your core motivations are around your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So each of these is different. And what's been really interesting is we've had our entire team take this. And we've had clients tell us they've taken this. And it's really clear once someone tells you their number, it's like, you're like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense to me. Because you might find that like, if you're a challenger number eight, you might want to be more disruptive with innovation. Like, yeah, let's disrupt. Let's get out ahead. You know, I, I want to do things differently. I don't want to do them the way we've done them internally where a number three, which is achiever, might be more competitive. Like, I want to be the best in our category. I want to do things the best way we can. So it's just different motivations, which can ultimately inform how our team or how we even think about innovation personally. So Colby, this is another one that we all do on our team, but it measures how a person takes action. So it includes four action modes. So fact finder, follow through, quick start, and implementation, and measures how you approach challenges. So a fact finder, so if you imagine if someone asked you to research, maybe it's your spouse or a partner, they say, let's go on a date night Friday. So if you have a high fact finder, you'd probably research different restaurants, what people have said about it, what the menu looks like. You're going to get really specific. If you're on the other end of fact finder, you're going to try to simplify. So you might find someone that you trust that knows the best restaurants and is just going to give you the best recommendation. And that's the furthest you're going to go with it. And what's really interesting about the Colby here is that a lot of the teams we work with have to sell through their innovation ideas or their strategic approach to a VP or someone else who can help implement the strategy. And so understanding where they may lie in the space can heavily impact how you present the information. So if you have an individual who is a high quick start, let's say, they're ready to improvise, try something new, act quickly, then they might need less information and more more messaging, more splashy ideas of what this thing is going to look like versus someone who might be a high fact finder would want lots and lots of detail to push an idea through. So this is a really good way for your organization internally to start communicating with the proper levels of information to really start pushing some ideas through. Yeah, this is great too. I mean, if your organization encourages this type of assessments, even knowing on your team who has a high follow through, who has a high quick start, you'll start to identify like what excites different individuals and also what, what where somebody might be questioning something. It's more that they want a process or they want a system that they can follow following maybe that, that one-off effort. Strengths finders. I think a lot of us are familiar with this one. So this identifies your natural strengths and talents. So this one can be great just in terms of like themes that maybe you see in terms of your team and how they approach innovation or kind of what the best mode of operation is. And the last one is the four tendencies. So this measures how people respond to expectations. And so this could be really interesting when you're thinking about kind of internal mandates or thinking about innovation. Um, like you can see the rebel would kind of want to do it their own way or kind of make something or want to kind of rebel against what has been done historically. So you can start to see some themes around how you and your team might approach innovation just from your unique perspective that you have or how your brain normally wants to operate. So as we get to the last couple of slides here in the last couple of minutes of this presentation, if you have any questions about fractal coding or how to diversify your thinking, please put it in the chat box and we'll see if we can get to some answers. And in the meantime, to revisit this question, what stage are you and your team in terms of the innovation process? Are you in pre-strategy, which is we don't know what we don't know. We want to go wide. We want to look at all these different areas, potentially want to grow into a new space front end of innovation, it's obviously a bit more narrow and you're looking to potentially fill a, a pipeline. Category analysis, seeing those shifts, the movement and momentum directly in your category. 
You might be in a product development process, which is looking for new technologies, potentially acquiring through a scouting program, finding some startups or some other companies that are gaining momentum, or go-to-market strategy, which is we actually have a really cool technology or we've been working on something, but we don't quite know the trend landscape in terms of how to launch this in the market. And so if you've worked with us before, or you're familiar with EBCO, we work with our clients across all of these areas. The pre-strategy is more about, are there opportunities that we might be missing? Front end of, of innovation and the landscape exploration is looking at consumer behaviors, driving growth in our category, how this category might be disrupted. The deep dive category analysis is looking at specific trends that are driving change and growth within the category. Product development and scouting, like we said, is more about acquisition and then of course, go to market strategy. So we'll just use these last few minutes. If anyone has to run to another meeting, great. thank you for coming on today. We'll be sending this out to you afterwards. If you're interested, if you've, some of you on, I know came on because you've been interested in working with us um, in the past, or you've been interested in our methodology, we're just going to spend the next few minutes just going over our core offerings. So if you're interested, please feel free to stick around. If you have a few extra minutes, if not, um, thanks for coming today. So in terms of EBCO's core programs, we frame up, it's always through the strategic objective of what we're looking at. So the objective might be around, you know, we really want to know what are the five to seven trends that are going to impact our category over the next five years. It might be, you know, we need new white space to innovate in and we want to have a process that's going to ultimately identify those areas. It might be looking at within the category, how do we create an ingredient pipeline? Especially if you're in food and beverage, you know how fast the, that category moves and being able to innovate and come up with things that you feel like are not kind of in response to what the rest of the market is doing. So our programs are typically structured through these five offerings that you see here. Um, so the first one is going on a trend expedition where we actually go and see these trends come to life in the market. This is great for food and beverage because we're able to actually go and taste and experience the trends. It's great for beauty and retail. And we've almost gotten to the point where we call these walking workshops because we're able to ID and generate so many ideas especially with your team's expertise and key players on there that might be from R&D or, you know, actual scientists on the team. It could be someone who's in charge of sales and selling this through to a retailer. And we also do trend investigations, which is where we take an objective and we frame up how, from a secondary research perspective, are we going to study this topic? And so there's a lot of strategic thinking that goes into actually how do we study something, especially when it's on such a fuzzy front end area. There's a lot of strategic thinking about how to build out that framework. Trend immersion workshops. So this is where we bring the trends to life in a workshop setting. And so this would be taking the trend research and building either immersive stations or different areas where teams can ideate and think about their products differently. Innovation pipeline is very specific to a team that is looking to fill a pipeline. And so out of the trend re research, they really want to make sure that's actionable. Actionability is one of the main things we hear uh, in the trend world is understanding how to make things that are actionable and actually going to have an ROI or a direct result. And so we really like these types of programs because one of the main things we want to do at EBCO is always have actionable results come out of the work that we do. Even uh, though on the front end, we can still have actionability for the category that we're looking at. And then finally, scouting investigation. So looking at acquisition targets, looking at new companies that the organization should be aware of. They could become key partners. Um, we've had a lot of companies you know, look at this lately because it's become a more central part of their strategy because they're developing tech capabilities. It could be that you have a really big challenge coming or the company is going into a new non-traditional area. Um, so you can imagine if, if you were in pets, let's say, I and mean, thinking about pet innovation, and the, let's say the category started to have slower growth, you might be thinking of like, well, what are other areas that where people either take care of something or utilize some of the same distribution or some of the same retail channels? Like, what are other areas we could go into and companies that we could acquire to help us get into those new spaces? And that's what we would consider a scouting. And thank you. So many people have stuck around to listen to us. So that's great. And oh, we just want to ask one final question. Are you interested in having EBCO reach out to you? It's simply yes, no, no one will know your answer, but if you do reply <laughs> yes, we'd be happy to, to connect in the future and have more conversations around what it is that you're looking into, anything we can answer about fractal coding, any additional information on the methodology. Uh, perhaps we have a report or we've studied an area that could be of interest to you that we can share. Um, so always interested in connecting. Thank you for some of those answers coming in. That's awesome. Have a wonderful day, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Um, this is one of our favorite topics. So again, if, if you didn't reply yes, please reach out to us. 
when the opportunity comes up to connect more and learn more about fractal coding and any of the methodologies or programs that EBCO runs for our clients. Great. Thanks, everyone. Here we are. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure having you all on, and we hope to connect with you soon. Bye.